It's an Australian first, a PET scan for your whole body with the ability to minimise scanning time and drive advancements in cancer research and neurological disorders among a few. Joining me live is Professor Adam Gastella, clinical psychologist and Michael Crouch Chair in Child and Youth Mental Health. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jane. Nice to see you in the studio. This sounds great. Tell us about the Australian first PET scan. Yeah, well, we're really, really excited about it. It's going to advance um, science and technology and lead to the development of new uh, procedures to improve healthcare uh, for Australians. Ultimately, um, what this technology allows us to do is to, to track um, at any stage across the entire body using um, PET scanning. So uh, previously, you'd have to choose one single part of the body to track with, um, and you might be able to only do one or two or three at most um, sections of that part of the body over, say, an hour period. Um, now we can do the entire body and we can see what happens um, across all the organs, including the brain and peripheral systems. Now you say, well, why do we care about that? Well, um, I'll give you just one example. We've been um, really interested in the hormone and neuropeptide oxytocin. It's, oxytocin was um, uh, sort of identified in 1955 and has been uh, responsible for muscle contractions in the human body. And so for... For, for decades, it's really been used to um, facilitate things like milk letdown, and a lot of women receive oxytocin in childbirth um, to facilitate contractions. And uh, in the 1970s, people noticed that um, oxytocin was hugely involved in bonding. So when mothers and babies would cuddle, um, they noticed that oxytocin would release throughout the body. Uh, and then there were lots of studies linking the release of oxytocin to bond formation, to empathy, to social cognition. Um, and then we started doing some studies showing that when you administered oxytocin, it improved social cognition and behaviour. So there's been lots and lots of studies over the last 20 years to say that oxytocin is fundamental to social life in humans. Mm. But the big mystery is when we administer it, how does it work? And there's been debates and there's been arguments um, and we've never been able to understand how oxytocin works because we can't study where the molecule goes. We don't know how it distributes. Um, and we rely very much in that way on animal studies to do all the, if you like, the dirty work. So what we did is we developed a, um, a ligand with researchers over in Vienna and New York, um, and, um, in Atlanta, and here in Sydney. And uh, we're leading this collaborative effort to, um, what we do is we fluorinate a part of the oxytocin molecule so we can track where it goes using uh, PET scanning technology, so we administer it and we can track where it goes in the brain and body. And for the first time, we'll be able to say what parts of the organs and brain oxytocin distributes to and how it improves social behaviour. Now, with that knowledge uh, across the entire body, we're going to be able to develop new therapies, uh, new approaches. We're going to be able to know when and how uh, best to use natural oxytocin to facilitate um, uh, social behaviour. And we're going to be able to develop uh, new therapies where we can administer um, different therapies to produce better outcomes. And that, that's just one example in, mm. in my space, but it's going to cross cancer and just about every part of um, medical science, um, th this, this technology is going to be used. Yeah, it sounds huge. And reducing the amount of radiation that we have being a whole body. Uh, well, absolutely. We'll, we'll, you know, you'll only need one scan to track the in, in, entire mm. body and then you can just do that across time. Um, so it really does uh, improve safety for the patients, but most uh, importantly from my perspective, along with safety, is uh, it improves science. Fantastic. And what about AI technology? Because uh, Sydney University has a hybrid theatre. We've got some vision to show our viewers. It's obviously, uh, you know, AI in technology in all sorts of areas, including medicine, is uh, really going gangbusters, isn't it? Oh, look, I, I think we're still getting our head around AI and where its potential will be. Uh, and in, for psychology practice, as an example, uh, I think that there's enormous potential for AI to uh, automate um, processes, to make therapy more accessible. Um, but I don't think it will necessarily um, replace the therapist. No, absolutely. But uh, certainly enhance it and you don't have that face-to-face, -face, um, you know, um, thing either. Well, one of the things of... that I, I really struggle with in therapy is w therapists are often re reliant on homework-like tasks. We mm. give our clients PDF files and ask them <laughs> to go and complete those tasks in between sessions. It's, it's really not engaging. Um, and we try and teach clients 
really good processes for emotion regulation um, and for problem solving. And those processes are often quite form formulaic, um, but they can be hard to learn. And so I think that um, there's enormous potential for AI to really change the game in that space and make it far more engaging and teach those strategies uh, in a way which is more likely for, for clients to learn and to, and to, and to do the tasks. I think the, the major concern in the AI space at the moment is around the generative AI. So if, if and there are examples where people are using AI like chatbots as counsellors. And we know that people, you know, they for some reason we, we, we tend to trust computers more than we trust humans. So they become a lot more open. They, they have this, people often feel like they can be um, more open with a, a machine and it's more anonymised. And so there's been cases of people becoming quite attached to the chatbot. And so I think that there is, you know, as I said, we're still getting our head around the, uh, the limits of AI and, and, and the governance around AI, but I think that's where the concern is. But around, um, you know, implementing clear processes and making um, really clear procedures more accessible to um, more of the population, I think that's where AI at the moment is well positioned to fill a gap. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I guess it's a good tool, but again, that whole face-to-face -face and that connection as we hear so much is so vital for human beings. Yeah, look, we run groups all the time as well. You know, we run mm. group therapy programs um, at, you know, for autistic people. And, um, you know, th those group programs, half of the benefit of those group programs, along with the therapy that they, they get, is the, the sort of the, the social side of it, the interaction. And I think when you're dealing with complex um, also issues that... The, the, the therapist-client relationship is, we, we know is super important. So I think they're the things where we're, we are going to have to use um, good science to understand the limits of AI, and I think that's, that there will be limits. Um, and we'll also, I think, we, you know, moving forward, we need to have a regulation uh, framework where um, you know, certain approaches can be recommended by our health bodies and certain approaches aren't. So at least parents and young pe and people in general can know what are the good tools to use and what are the ones that probably they should give a miss. Yeah, very interesting times ahead, but I really appreciate your time and expertise. Professor, thank you so much. Thanks, we'll Jane. We'll see you next time. We'll see you next time. Yeah, it was great. Thank great. you.